best that I can. I must have crossed a million valleys and shed a million tears. But when I come to the river of Jordan, hallelujah, I will have no fear. I will have no
John chapter number four. John chapter number four. It's nice to be reminded of victory, amen. 
Amen. Hey, it's nice to be reminded of victory. Amen. Hey, it's nice to be... Hey, let me talk to my fellow um, uh, Mountaineer family. Hey, hey, it's nice to be reminded of victory once in a while. Amen. Amen. Hey, I know some of you come in here depressed, but get over yourself, honey. Hey, man, the Irish still won. <clears throat> hey, man. Hey, they ain't going to mess with you no more, are they? Nope. Hey, man, I got a green tie on. It's gold in the tie. Amen. Yeah. Yeah, Amen. Glory to God. It's nice to be reminded that he ain't in no grave. (laughs) And we don't have to go. (laughs) Amen. You may may lay this body down. (laughs) But I'll be gone. (laughs) Glory to God. (laughs) You see, uh, I, I like winning. You, anybody in here like losing? If you are, you're a sicko, amen? And I don't want to have no fellowship with you. <laughs> I like victories. I remember being in 11th grade at Riverside High School, and we, the, the, we started our season, our baseball season, at, at, at 13 and 0. 13 and 0, we was the best baseball team uh, in the Valley. And we were ranked like third in the in the state. We looked good, boys. And then, you know, you know how you mess up a good thing? You change everything. And the coach got fiddling around with our lineup and, and putting in new pitchers and all this stuff. We did not win another game. F- went from 13 and 0, third in the state, looking great, to last place. First time, I mean, first losers, amen. Just, just bad, horrible. And I'll be honest with you, I got, I got so tired of baseball. Because, listen, I got so tired of baseball, I didn't want to look at a baseball. I didn't want to think about a baseball. If somebody wanted me to go to West Virginia Power Game, I said no. I didn't want to play baseball on a PlayStation. I didn't want to look at a wiffle ball. I didn't want to even think about baseball because I didn't like losing. Amen. And I said, I don't want to play baseball this summer to my parents. I said, I'll get a job. I'll go work at Rock Lake Putt-Putt. I got a job down there. Uh, uh, lasted one whole day. <laughs> uh, amen. Apparently, they did. I, I wasn't good enough at Putt-Putt. But I was a nut-nut about Putt-Putt. Uh, but... <laughs> I, uh, the, 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 the coach of the summer league team at Northeast Little League was, uh, was my next door neighbor for the uh, big league team. Uh, big league was 16 to 18 years old, and I fit that category. And he, he seen me, he said, Coy, that's how he talked, Coy, you will play ball for me this summer? I said, no. I said, I don't want to look at a baseball. I'm tired of losing. He said, we ain't going to lose. I said, you ain't gonna lose. You guarantee that we ain't gonna lose. We ain't gonna lose. We're gonna good. We're gonna be good. Come on, go play. I said, no, I'm not playing baseball this summer. I, I listen. I got some. I got some girls lined up. I'm going to date, hey, ma'am. And that didn't work out either. I'm gonna work at putt putt. That didn't work out. Uh, and I, I'm just gonna hang out with my buddies. He said, how about you come play baseball for me? And I said, no. He said, come to one practice. Come to one practice. I said, listen, we've lost all year long, and I don't want to play baseball no more. I don't want to hear somebody scream at somebody about a baseball. I don't want to look at one. I don't want to smell the field anymore. And he said, come practice. So I come to practice. And I got down there, and I, 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 I was playing first base, and I remember Chris Holstein was playing. I didn't even know he was playing. And uh, he threw a ball over, and I caught it. And I picked up the ball and I slung it home plate. And we got a dude getting out, or got a guy going home out at the same time. So we made a double play. And I got real excited. And then it was my turn to bat. And I hit the ball and, and I got excited. And, and at the end of the practice, he goes, Corey, you going to play for me? I said, yeah, I'll be here. When's the next practice? He said, well, you got to go over there and pay the guy $35. Amen. <laughs> So you can have a jersey and sign the paperwork, and then you can play. And I said, all right. And you see, it, it, 
everything changed based off one conversation. You see, when I got there, I was defeated. When I got there, I was down. When I got there, I didn't want to play. I didn't even want to think about playing. I went through the motions of playing because I was on the field. But as I started playing, that conversation led to me experiencing victory. And, 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 and together we won all summer long. It was wonderful. But if we had not had the conversation, I'd have never experienced the victory of that summer of 2002. And it was wonderful. And I love baseball today. I get to coach little knuckleheads and coach pitch. I get to throw at them. Amen. Um, sometimes literally, sometimes figuratively. Um, but I get to throw baseballs to them every, every, every couple of days. And I love it now because somebody had a conversation with me. But let me ask you this. I, 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 our, let's talk about life. I wonder if there's anybody in here who's tired of losing. Listen, I had a conversation with a friend this week. And uh, I, I started reflectively talking. You're dangerous if you reflective talk. Because I promise you that if you weren't depressed before you started talking, you'll be depressed by the end of your talking. And I started thinking about all the losing I've done since... 2019 and every and listen I every loss played through my mind I've lost friends I've lost family I've lost fellowship I've lost people that I didn't think I'd lose I lost a nephew who was who just turned 14 years old you're not supposed to lose somebody like that I've lost grandparents I've lost friends, people I truly cared about. I lost, I, 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 lost, I lost loved ones who weren't part of my family. And some of the hardest days of my life was over the last two years of losing. And let me tell you this, when you lose something, don't mean that you ain't going to forget about it. Matter of fact, I'm going to say it like this, there's always a box score to the loss. And every now and then we like to get the papers out and read the box scores of the history of our loss. And, and I tell you what, I've been looking at the history of the losses of the, some of the people in the room this, uh, this week. And I started considering all of the people. And, and you know what, we've done a lot of losing together this year. Amen. 2020, 2021, there's a lot of losing. And I don't know about you, but I want to say this. I'm tired of losing. I am, I'm completely tired of it. I'm tired of feeling this way. I'm tired of experiencing loss after loss after loss. And it hit real hard there Friday. I, I had to come home from school to sit down and think about it. And, and tears run down off of my face. And I started telling God I was tired of losing. I'm tired of seeing people leave. I'm tired of seeing people stay home. I'm tired of seeing friends uh, fighting other friends. I'm tired of losing and the devil's winning. And I'm tired to seeing him have his chant at the end of the game and, and, and talking about how good his life is and how wonder I said God I'm tired of losing I, I don't want to lose anymore I'm, I'm tired of losing Lord can you help me find some victory and I said show me your word he led me to John chapter number 4 in John chapter 4 we find a little lady who was tired of losing we find in her, her coming to the well that, that this day that, that when she thought nobody else would be there, she found a man who had a conversation with her. And from that conversation, everything changed. And if you don't mind standing for the reading of God's Word as we look at that conversation in verse number 6, uh, he, he, uh, the Bible says, And now Jacob's well was there. Uh, Jesus therefore being wearied with his journey. He sat thus on the well and it was about the sixth hour. And there cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water and Jesus said unto her, Give me to drink. He said for, uh, the Bible says, For his disciples were gone away into the cities to buy meat. The Bible then says, 
the, uh, then saith the woman unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, ask, askest me of a drink? Uh, he, which am also uh, uh, am a woman of Samaria, for the Jews have no dealings with us. And verse number 10 says, And Jesus said unto her, If you only knew. <laughs> it says, If thou knowest the gift of God and who it is that, thou, that, 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 that saith to thee, Give me drink, thou wouldest turn around and ask him. Listen, this is, I'm sorry I'm adding some stuff here. You just turn around and look at me and say, uh, Will you give me a drink? And I'll give you the whole well. <laughs> Now turn down, to the, let's, let's continue down to verse number 25. It says this, And the woman saith unto him, I know the Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. And when he, say, when he is come, he will tell us. And Jesus said, I that speak unto thee am he. And upon this uh, came his disciples and marveled that he uh, and marveled that he talked to, with the woman. Uh, yet no man said, "Why speakest thou, or, or why talkest thou unto uh, with her?" And uh, the woman then left her water pot. Woo. We'll get back to that. And went her way into the city and saith to him, to the man, "Come, see a man, which told me." All things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for being so good to us. Lord, we ask you, God, that you take your Bible. Lord, and speak to us. Lord, there's so many losses in the room. We have some that lost their husbands. Some that's lost their wives. Some that lost their daddies and mamas. And there's some people here who's lost friends and family. Lord, the pandemic has divided our country. And, and we've lost more, uh, more relationships out of pride and arrogance than we have out of death. And God, I pray that you would help us today as we deal with loss. Because we're tired of losing. And I pray that you'd empty me of self and see and fill me with your spirit because today it's the Super Bowl. And God, I pray that you, together we leave, no doubt. For it's in your name we pray, amen. You may be seated. In our scripture today, we, <clears throat> we have seen a, a woman. The Bible gives us no name for this woman. Names are important in the Bible because you can look at the name and find out a little bit about their character. She has no name. She has no name. Did you hear that? There's no name ascribed to this woman. She has a nationality, but she has no name. Sorry, that ain't in my notes. It just hit me real good. You see, because sometimes the world, they, they know our nationality. They know our look. They know what we, we look like, talk like. They know our, our social security number. They know our addresses. They know our dirt birth date. They know our bank account information. And they're listening to us on our phones. <laughs> but they don't know us. We have no name to them. We're just a number. Hmm? The Bible doesn't say anything about a name, though, does it? No name. But the Bible does give us some observations of some things that we can know about her. We know that she's a Samaritan. She's from Samaria. We know that she, was, she had to go get her daily provision of water. But we find that the Bible says that she's going there in the sixth hour. That's noon. So she's going there on the sixth hour, so there must be some importance applied there. And because we know that she's going there at noon, and we know that she is, uh, uh, that it's got to be important because the Bible said it, we've got to look at the rest of the story to figure out why she may have been there in the sixth hour and not at any other hour. Well, look at verse number 18. I believe that, that Jesus himself. Uh, uh, helps us to understand this. Uh, you see, Jesus uh, tells her to go get her husband, and he hit her with a with a, with that loaded statement. She said, "I no, I don't got a husband." 
Amen. If you don't want somebody to know, I, I believe you mumble. Amen. So they don't really get it. So when I read the Bible, sometimes I mumble for people. And he said, hold up, wait, wait, you got, no, 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 thou hast had five husbands, verse 18, and he who you have now is not your husband. Woo. Now, I've pre- I'll be honest with you, I've preached this a million different times of ways. Most of the time, I preach it as the preacher who preached to me preached it. Or the, the evangelist that I went to listen at the camp meeting where the saw, gra- or the saw dust was uh, all over the place and they had hay bales as altars and, and they'd get up there and they'd turn all red face and they'd scream at us and, and then and they'd throw chairs at each other. It was great. Hellfire and brimstone, that's how I'd preach it. But I, I'm going to tell you what, this weekend I read this a different way. Matter of fact, I was scheduled to priest on the pre, uh, p- preach on the priesthood of the believer today. But God interrupted the sermon series to give us something different today. Because He wanted to answer Miss Nancy the question to me of, well, why do I keep losing? I hate losing. And so I started looking at her story and I started really letting God marinate. Listen, some people meditate on the Word. I'd rather marinate in the Word. Amen? So I let it permeate. In, Daniel, this will teach you something. It, it let it permeate deep into my pores. Amen? And listen, and then He heats me up and the flavor just explodes out. Amen? Yeah. So I started thinking, you see the text does identify that there is sin in her life. But Jesus doesn't spend much time on it, does he? So if Jesus ain't got no time for it, then what do I got time for it? You see, what did Jesus do? He spent more time dealing with the havoc of her past. You see, she had so much wreckage going on around her that that, that, uh, that in her history that that God or Jesus wanted to deal with it. You see, she didn't sit, listen, she didn't wake up one morning and say, I want to have five husbands. I I can't listen. She didn't she didn't listen. She didn't buy a Barbie doll and five Ken dolls and sit down and play her house. She didn't no, no, honey. She didn't do it. She didn't go uh, get a G.I. Joe and put him in a in a house on the backside and say, I can't wait to leave all of the Kens to go to G.I. Joe. No. Listen, that wasn't a blip on a radar. Listen, when she met, listen, when her daddy got her hooked up with her husband and he gave him a cow and, a, and, and some money and, 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 and listen, and some property, she said she, she, she fell in love. Because he promised that he'd take her from her daddy. He'd give her a house over her head, shoes on her feet and food on her table. And he loved and comfort and cared for her for sickness and in health. Till death do they part. When she walked down, I just picture this little girl walking down the aisle. And she got her mascara running down off her face because she's crying from tears of joy. And here's this this hunk of a man standing up there that her daddy approved. Listen, that her daddy approved. Did, did, did you hear that? that her daddy approved of? Where's Ava? Somebody go tell her. Man, she got her eyes on some boy in preschool. I'm like to give some knuckle sandwiches out. <laughs> And there he is, he's standing there all regal. She's walking down the aisle, the, the, the rabbi's up there, I don't know. And they, they begin to go through the, the cadence of marriage. And she says, I do, and he says, I do. And, and they leave there and they, they go home to their little house with their, their, their little little job and he and he he brings a little bit of food on the table and they ain't got much but what they got they got together and they're in, they're just enjoying life together but then all of a sudden tragedy hits Oh, just think about it, how tragedy hits that home. And listen, she didn't wake up going, I can't wait to have a tragedy. I can't wait to experience pain. But then all of a sudden, tragedy hits her home. And the husband that she loved and cared about is now gone. I don't know any preachers preach it like that. And then, in Bible custom, the day would have dictated that her that he probably had a brother. 
She didn't have no kids. He didn't have no heir. So what was his job? His job was to take her and to marry her and to provide for her and to give him an heir. So the married brother now has two wives. One he got with naturally with, and was growing in love towards and another that was thrown on him as another responsibility. He would facilitate her need and he would give her a son and and then she'd hold that baby and love that baby and care for that baby. But then all of a sudden uh, uh, the the wife number one gets mad at wife number two and and she's frustrated because he gave her a little bit of attention and the baby's crying and keeping the whole house up all night and she's frustrated. She tells him it's either that woman or this woman but one of us gots to go. So he left her, kicked her out on the street, her and the baby, to go walk around alone. And she meets some man who says, I give you what you need. She goes home with him. She's there for a couple of months and he's beating on her, railing on her, doing everything he wants to, treating the baby bad. Yeah. Now she's... She's in a situation where she can't leave her kid like that. He kicks her out because she stood up for herself. She finds another man, same old story. Finds another man, same old story. Well, now she's been through five husbands. The Bible says that she's with another man. And I just imagine this man may be a little bit better to her, Brother Jim. And he treats her good, he loves her, he cares about her, he provides for her, but he can't marry her because all the stuff in her past, his tradition won't let him have her. So now, not only is she a widow, but she's a train wreck of a person who has a history of, uh, 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 of behaviors in her life that would, would change uh, every one of us and make us think a little bit. Listen, let, instead, of less, instead of less railing on her about her sin, let's talk about what may have brought this on. You see, because mm, listen, because uh, some people uh, don't wake up one morning wanting to be this way. Sometimes life takes them there and they have to deal with their life. Mm-hmm. Now, she's going to the well one morning. Same old time, same old place. All the, all the, the hens of the home are there. And there's a new hen in town. Wife number one of the brother-in-law. She's standing there in the hen party talking about... I'm not allowed to say that, am I? Is that improper? They're talking, they're having themselves a gossip fest, and here she comes. She's got tattered clothes on, and she, her, her sandals don't match, and she's walking, and all she's thinking about is, is that she's going to get some water and, and say hello to the ladies and go home and take care of her family. But, but there's wife number one, and she's mad at him. She's frustrated. She says to that girl, we don't want your kind around here. We don't need your kind in our well, poisoning our well. So you just take your little water pot and you go home. Now, the shame builds up inside of her because she's already devalued herself because she was devalued by a man. And she all broke because she's broken because of her tragedies of her past. And now she got to walk in a mess. She, she goes home and she's shaking her hands. Are so shaking. She's so frustrated. She's so there's tears in her eyes. And she said, "I, I don't. I can't go back down there in the morning. I, the, that woman's gonna be down there waiting. I got this empty water pot. And I, I don't want to go down there with them." And she said, "But I, I'm gonna have to go." So she's like, "Well, I'll just wait a little bit. And I'll go on my own time." And at noon, she decided that'd be her time for water. She go down there every day at noon. She'd fill her little water bucket, come home. 
where everybody else started early in the morning and they were able to have fresh water in the morning with their breakfast and they'd, they'd be able to wash their clothes in fresh water and they'd be able to wash their hands in fresh water and they listen to all, of the, all the things that, that they did. They did it with something fresh, but she would be at home doing, washing her clothes in stale water, in stagnant water. She'd wash her hands and she'd sit there with this old water from yesterday that, that listen, that, that, that once was something nice and something worth having is now just a, uh, just a, just a tragedy of a substance. And, and so here she is on, 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 on that certain morning at, at, at the sixth hour at noontime. She's walking to the well. Miss Nancy, she's wearing her, her clothes that have been washed in yesterday's water. she got hands washed in yesterday's water. Because she's yesterday's news. She comes walking up. And she comes walking up there. Thinking, hey, well, no, I don't have to deal with no, nobody mean to me today. I don't have to deal with nobody cussing me today. I don't have any, nobody going to throw any rocks at me. Nobody's going to try to do anything to me. And then she sees somebody off in the distance. She said, oh, man, there's somebody at my well. I don't want to go down to that well. There's some dude down there, and I can't take my water pot down there with that dude down there. I can't be associating with some guy. They already got talking about me behind my back down there in the middle of the city. I, I can't talk to this guy. And she said, well, I can't. T- I got to take some water home to my husband. I got to t- or t- to my boyfriend. I got to take some water home to my baby. And I, I got I to take care of business at home. But, but then she gets a little bit closer, and Jesus looks at her. Jesus makes eye contact with her. And then Jesus says, hey, give me a drink. There's a lot of stuff in the give me a drink. So much, so much stuff. I, I can't get on, I can't go through it, but I do know this. <laughs> but um, listen, when he spoke to her, everything about her began to change because the conversation was engaged. Hey, listen, everything changed about her because the conversation was engaged. And, and listen, G- Jesus would address her. N- listen, Jesus would address her uh, not from the person she used to be, but who she's going to be when he's finished with her. And the Bible records for us that she took that water pot of reminders that she'd been carrying with her every day. And listen, that water pot that reminded her that she was broken. That water pot that reminded her that she was burdened. That water pot that said that she was a loser. That she was nothing and a nobody. And Jesus acknowledged who she was. And she left the water pot behind because there was no need of feeling like she used to be. No need of experience who she used to be. Hey, honey, I'm here to tell you this morning. I'm tired of losing but I'm talking to somebody who's a winner yeah man she learned how to live victorious through Jesus Christ yeah man I don't know about you but I want to be a winner listen I'm tired of 2020 lifestyle I'm tired of being angry I'm tired of being frustrated I'm tired of losing people I'm tired of losing friends I'm tired of losing fellowship I'm just tired of losing period but I came here today to seek victory from the Lord Jesus Christ to have a conversation that I changed my life forever I wonder have you come here for the same reason the Bible says that we can have some victory too because of what Jesus can do. He made her a, a winner. I wonder how do you want to be a winner too? You say, well, how does she, she become a winner? How did he make her a winner? Look at verse number, uh, verse number 7. The Bible says this in verse number 7. There cometh a woman of Samaria and draw water, and Jesus saith unto her, Give me a drink. Now I want you to look at verse number 9 for her reaction. He says, saith the, you, you said to me uh, uh, of Samaria, uh, un, uh, uh, then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me? Which am a woman of Samaria. For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritan. Hey, how, why are you talking to me? 
She was surprised that her existence was being acknowledged. Oh man, if she only knew the depth of acknowledgement that Jesus would take to get in a conversation with her, she would have just jumped on her knees right then and there and called Him the Christ. You see, the Bible tells us uh, in verse number 10 that, uh, that if she'd only knew the, the gift of God who, who that, uh, that, that, that saith unto the, her, give me a drink, uh, she would have uh, asked Him that, uh, and He would have gave her living water. So let's consider for a moment what the depths that Jesus did had to overcome to acknowledge her. In verse number 3 we find that uh, he left Judea intending to go to Galilee. But before he could get to Galilee in verse number 4 he said, I must needs go through Samaria. I have a purpose there. (laughs) You see, and from, from Judea to, 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 to uh, Shiker, where the, this uh, well was, was 25 miles. You see, he was willing to travel to overcome a distance to have a conversation. Did you hear that? He was willing to overcome a distance to have a conversation that would bring victory into her life. <laughs> Listen, I don't know about you, but I'm thankful for the distance that he traveled to have a conversation with me. Honey, I, I, listen, I just came here this morning to tell you he come from heaven to earth. He bled and died. He went into a tomb and rose again so that he could sit at the right hand of the Father to make intercession for you and for me. He went a long distance, a long distance so that he could have a conversation. When was the last time you talked to him? Hmm. She, he acknowledged her, her existence because he traveled the distance. Amen? Not only did he overcome the distance, but he also overcome the social norms. In verse number 9, it tells us that, 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 uh, that the social norms were dictated that Jesus shouldn't even be speaking to her. Shouldn't even be talking to her. Listen, he shouldn't even have came to her. There was no water of healing for her. If you read through the Old Testament, honey, you're going to find <laughs> you're going to find that he had his dealings with the Jews. And the social norms said that that the Messiah was going to come to save them. But there's this little group of people called the Gentiles. Let me give you let me give you the the, the redneck dictionary, amen, of Gentiles as everybody else. That's all us-ins. Mm-hmm. We sees. Amen? Uh, yeah. Uh, he, he, he came to us. Because they didn't want nothing to do with him. And we won't have everything to do with him. You see, he overcomes social norms to become our Savior. But, he, but then also, he, he was battling fatigue, too. Yeah. If you look at verse number one, you, you identify the problem. Of the Lord's fatigue, it was the the Pharisees, the the religious leaders who were exercising uh, 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 dictation in his life, telling him what to do, how to do it, when to do it. They say, you can do this, but you can't do this. Amen? Religious people always trying to tell uh, people trying to get close to God what they should and shouldn't do. Mm Mm-hmm. They said, we're okay with John the Baptist baptizing, but we ain't okay with you baptizing. So he had all this political pressure. He had all this political pressure where they tried to tell him what he could or could do. (laughs) I keep going because some of you ain't ready for that. Y'all, y'all still all proper, I guess. Jim, teach your Sunday school lessons about that. <laughs> Can't. But then he had to travel on top of that 25 miles. And I don't know about you, but have you ever been alone walking before? Have you ever been alone walking with people who never shut up? That's, he had disciples, and they were walking with him. 
And I bet they was talking the whole time, Brother Mike, about the Pharisees and what they was trying to tell him to do. Could you just imagine John sitting there going, Remember that time when the Pharisees was talking? And Peter's like, I want to cut their ears off, man. <laughs> Thomas said, I doubt it. <laughs> Judas said, show me the money. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> See what happens when you marinate in it, brother. <laughs> it gets weird, too. It doesn't marinate too long. And, but it comes to the well. Do you see why he came to the well, though? What does the Bible say in verse number 6? It says, it says that he was wearied. He was tired. And who was coming to him was somebody else who was tired. So what did you say, preacher? I'm saying this. Jesus met her where she was. Not only on a physical level, but on a mental, spiritual level. They met both weary from being beat on by the world. <laughs> Listen, I'm here to report to you that every time I've met up with him, he's met up with me in the same state. Listen, but I'm thankful. I'm thankful when he acknowledges my existence. He doesn't leave me in a weary state. Listen, I may have carried my water pot in, but I'm leaving it far behind. I said I may have brought it in with me, but when he acknowledged my existence, it changed who I was, and the water pot that I was carrying is no longer needed for me to whine and complain y'all ain't even close to being ready today are you <laughs> he does it to us Ephesians 1 4 says this according as he has chosen us oh y'all didn't think I'd work in chosen somewhere so that we could count this in the sermon series chosen us in him before the foundation of the world isn't that a long distance to come to you <laughs> that we should be, here's our purpose, holy, without blame before Him. And look at this, in love. Let's go on to the next one. Jesus made her a winner when He acknowledged her existence, but He also, uh, also did it when he, when he examined her condition. Verse 16 said, And Jesus saith unto her, Go call thy husband. Come hither. Then the woman answered, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou sayest, or thou hast uh, well said, I have no husband, for thou hast five husbands. And he whom thou, uh, thou, know, thou, thou hast is not thy husband. In that sayest thou truly. He said, You didn't lie to me about your living condition. You didn't, you, didn't, you, you didn't lie to me about the state in which you're living because the husband that you, or the person that you're living with is not. Your husband. But you lied to me when you said you don't have a husband because in fact you have five husbands. I wonder if there's anybody guilty of shining. Shining themselves up to look good. And you'll shape the lifestyle you're living to make it look better to some stranger. And he ain't, he ain't yet told her that he ain't no stranger. But she just figuring it out. Amen. He said, you shine this up. Let me break it down for you. He said, I said that so that I could look at you and understand where you are. As I've already seen where I'm going to do and I'm going to make a change. But I got to see where you're at. Hmm? Have you ever been to the eye doctor? You can sit down in that little eye doctor chair. He puts that little fuzzy thing on the screen. He, he slams that little eye thing down in front of you. You know what I'm talking about. Puts the Listen, y'all know, they put that alcohol wipe on there. It smells like it and it shoves it right up to your face. Your eyes sting a little bit, just a little bit. And you look there and they got all them, them letters up there. 
And they're all so close. They all look like bees at first. Amen. Even the tea looks like a bee to me sometimes. And I look up there and he said, can you see it? Well, yeah, I can see something. Well, read me the smallest line. T. Is that as far as you can go? Yeah. yeah, yeah you, you. And then he goes, he goes, he goes, now tell me. Do you see it now? Read another line. I go, I go, E, F, Z, T, C. Good, good. Okay, now tell me, is it better one or two? And he, I'm sorry you flipped that too fast. Can you go a little slower? One, two. You know, you know what I mean? You say, why is he doing all this stuff? Why is he asking all these? Why are you asking all these questions, bro? Why are you coming at me like this, asking all of these things? I, look, look, I came here for glasses. He's going to give me glasses. He knows he's going to give me glasses because I couldn't read the tea. But what he's doing is, is he's, he's examining my eyes to, to, to fix the diagnosis, to, to make sure that I got the right prescriptions so that he could fix what I had wrong with me. If y'all didn't notice, these crazy eyes right now is for a reason. Jesus has been asking you a lot of questions lately. And it feels like losing. And maybe it's because he's reminding you of the law so that he could fix the prescription to what you need so that you can see clearer in your life. So what sometimes losing is really about victory. And, and listen, sometimes the loss is to show you how much you're winning. And I wonder how many of you have, to have, have recognized and seen through some clear eyes today that Jesus works all things together for good to them that love God and to them that are called according to His purpose. Hey, to whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to become conformed unto the image of Christ. Amen. Listen, don't just quote 28. Go on to 29. It changes everything. Yeah, but we got a purpose. He brings it to us. I love that. Every head bowed and every eye closed. No, don't. No. We, uh, see, I know this because I'm your pastor. And I know this that God's working things to make you see clearer. But you're a whole lot like a bunch of Avas. We took Ava to have a hearing test a couple of months ago because she says, huh, a lot. And she was making her mama mad. <laughs> yeah. What? Huh? Huh? And then she'd just do what she wanted to do. And it, so we thought, she can't be this defiant. She must not be able to hear. So we got our hearing pro test. Amen. I am not lying about this. This really happened. This is not evangelistically stretched, okay? This is a real story. She, we took her in there. They put these little headsets on her. And they said, Ava, when you hear the sound, raise your hand. She sat there. For a good four and a half minutes. And that lady looked at us and goes. And I go, Ava, when you hear the sound, raise your hand. She said, okay, let's start over. <laughs> so she starts the tone over. And she's sitting there. Said, he goes, Ava, if you hear the sound, raise your hand. She goes, Sydney sat there and would have to constantly remind the knucklehead that she had to raise her hand every time she heard a tone. But we found out something. She can't hear. She just needs to be told over and over and over. You say, why did you tell me that, preacher? Because you, listen, I've been your pastor for a long time now, and I know this. Listen, God's been testing you, and you're sitting there like Dava. He said, raise your hand if you hear me. Somebody got to come along, smack you upside the head once in a while and say, brother, it's time to raise your hand. He's been telling to tell you something for days now. Listen, you say, I'm a loser. He said, no, no, you're a winner. Because I designed you to be a winner. 
and I, I acknowledged your existence and, and I examined your condition and I found you winning. But lastly, he, he, he did this for her. He energized her testimony and this is it. This is I'm done, all right? Verse number 28 says this, And the woman left her water pot and went her way into the city. And look what she said. Come see a man. But who does she say it to? The men. She said, all the men. Your wife's been talking about me. <laughs> You've been looking dirty at me. Y'all act like y'all can't see me. But I'm going to give you the opportunity to meet a man who told me everything I ever did in my life uh, down to the last drop. Of, uh, listen, I'm telling you this. Uh, that woman went from, from mm, that woman went down there with a testimony on her heart energized by the Lord Jesus Christ and she began to proclaim the Lord Jesus Christ is the Savior. The Lord Jesus Christ is the Savior. And you say, why am I going through this loss? Why am I going through this pain? So that you you can stand up with, with, with your hand raised high and say, I know that He is the Savior. I know that He is the Savior. And I hate losing just as much as anybody else, but I know this. In Jesus Christ, I am more than a conqueror. I have experienced pain of loss. And listen, but I've experienced the victory of knowing that Jesus Christ has paid it all and I'm going home with Him someday. He left us, lifts us from losing to victory so that we can praise. Amen. This Thursday night was a blessing. We had a fun time, didn't we, Brother Chris? Miss Terry, we had a good time, didn't we? She's talking to the baby right now. I'll talk to her later. We had a good time, didn't we? Uh, it, was a, it was We had a small little... Uh, gathering with our uh, um, uh, addiction ministry but uh, I tell you what the greatest blessing of my life is is hearing testimonies of people who's been changed we had a little lady Miss Lynn sat right here where you sit and uh, we had one of those discussion meetings discussion meetings scare me as a pastor because I don't know what's going to happen and I may be a bit of a control freak and so you never know what somebody's going to say. And you can't put words in their mouth. You just let them talk. And then pray that Jesus fixes it. We had a lady who, I, I don't know if y'all remember this, she came and got saved. She'd been dealing with it for four months. Came and got saved. Got, has a little boy cutest little boy I know some some of our ladies has seen him downstairs and got to uh, got to babysitting while the meeting's going on and I, if I'm correct this is the first time she's talked to my knowledge it's the first time she's talked and uh, one of my favorite things she didn't talk about a system she didn't talk about the struggle she talked about the Savior and I tell you why we do what we do on Thursday night is not for the system or the struggle, but we do it so that people meet the Savior. Yeah. <laughs> and I wonder how many times you get on your Facebook and talk about the system. More, more you guys talk about the government than anybody I ever met, you bunch of crazies. Y'all talk about health care and science and numbers more than anybody I know. Oh, yeah, y'all hate me now, don't you? Uh -huh. You get on there, you talk about the system, and you talk about the struggle. I'm tired of losing. I know a people that's, that's tired of losing. You put it on your Facebook. You put it in paragraph form, double-spaced, Times New Roman, 14-point font. You... You put it on there, you got to click it twice to get it all revealed. Because huh? you're in pain. And you ain't afraid to tell people about your struggles. 
You ain't afraid to fix the system. But I wonder how often you take the Savior and you lift him up. He acknowledged your existence. He looked you in the eye when nobody else would. And in the depths of your sin and your pain and your struggle of loss, he said, I know who you are. And I didn't make you like this to leave you like this. <laughs> and then, mm, listen, he, woo, uh, I, I, I'm trying to shut down, but I just can't today. <laughs> and, then he, and then he looked at your condition. He said, I can fix you. He begins to work it all out. David said, God's good. His way is straight. He said, His way is good. And then there's a couple verses in between, but then he ends up saying this. He makes your way good. He, he said this, God has his way of fixing things. I'm tired of losing. It's time to stop hanging out with losers. Going to the well with losers who talk about me. And they will look at my cracked pot <laughs> and my ragged clothes. I'm going to have to change my time. It's noon now. Noon 30. <laughs> and it's time... And I take my meeting up with somebody who went a lot longer distance to meet with me than I'm going to meet go to meet with him. But I tell you what I told them on Thursday night. The greatest distance I've ever traveled to experience freedom was the distance I traveled to my knees. And I wonder if you're here tonight and you've accepted him as Savior. As every head bowed and every eye closed, nobody looking around. If you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus Christ, may I say to you that He loves you, He cares about you, He died to set you free and to do all things to work, to make life better for you. If you're here today and you've never accepted Him as Savior, today's your day. If you're here today and you have accepted Him as Savior, you should give testimony to that. And I want to ask you to raise your hand as high as you can and say, if Jesus comes or I should die, I'm ready to meet Him. Here's my hand. Here's my hand. Amen. Amen. Maybe you're here today and you couldn't raise your hand. Let me ask you this. Would you like to be saved? If you're here today and you say, I don't know if I've ever been saved or I'd like to know, I'm... I'm a little confused about it. I'd like some assurance to be pray for me, preacher. I want you to raise your hand. Ain't nobody looking around. No cameras out there. It's just you and me. If you just simply raise your hand, I'll pray for you. Amen. See that hand. Anyone else? Maybe you're here today and you say this, preacher, I'm tired of losing. I've lost a lot this year over the last couple of years. I've lost a lot and, and, and I keep focusing in on the loss. Would you pray for me that I could have a conversation with the king that would change all the losses into victories. Here's my hand. Here's my hand. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Yes. Yes. Amen. How about we do this this morning? How about we step out of our, hand, out of our seat? We've raised our hands. Now let's do something about it. Let's make a commitment. Let's call on the king. I wonder if you get out of your seat this morning, come down to this altar. This one's come. How about you? And, and you make a commitment, make a calling. Talk to God. Have a conversation with Christ. Won't you come? Won't you come? Say, Lord, I, I, need, to, I need victory in my life. I'm tired of losing. I'm tired of seeing losing. I'm tired of hanging out with losers. I want to get, across, I want to get in a conversation with you and show me how to be a winner. Maybe you're here today and you need to understand that He knows who you are. And he loves you. And He died for you to set you free. These have come. How about you?
I thank you for this day. I thank you for being so good to us. I thank you for your word and what it means to us. Lord, I pray that today would be a different kind of day. Lord, as we stop losing and seek victory. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, just a reminder. <clears throat> uh, we have a few things going on. Uh, but tonight we will have church. We will have church. Uh, Brother um, Trevor. Uh, Trevor will be preaching for us tonight, um, so make sure you're out for that. Um, pray for your preacher. I'll be doing or doing a, a funeral this week and, and or tomorrow and tonight. We've got the wake for my uncle, and uh, don't forget about this week is Recovery Church. Uh, we we do True Freedom does uh, three meetings a month, and then on the fourth meeting we ha or. Is, the, is it the first meeting of the month? The first meeting of the month, we, um, we have a real church service. We have singing and preaching. And, uh, and, and God has truly blessed us. We've seen people saved in those services yeah. and baptized now. Yeah. Speaking of baptisms, we're going to have baptisms in a couple weeks. Uh, a victory service. My, my, my man right here. Uh, raise your hand. Right you. We're going to be yeah. baptizing. Yeah. We're going to be baptizing him in the next couple of weeks. And, uh, hey man, let's give him a hand, yeah. How about that, yeah. mama? He, he wants his little boy to be here, so we're going to schedule a date to, uh, when he can be here so we can baptize him, and we'll let everybody else know if you like to be baptized. After salvation comes baptism, all right? What is baptism? It's when that water turns all these different colors into blood. And it change. No, it doesn't do that. It's just water. And what does it mean? It means I'm showing everybody else out there that I've been buried in Christ Jesus. I'm risen a new creature. I, it's my first testimony to the world that I have been changed. Okay? And if you'd like to participate in that, we'd like to do that. He, he, he also said he wants to join the church. In a couple of weeks, we'll be having our church membership class again. Amen. Amen. And we would like to invite anybody who would like to be a part of that uh, to, uh, to come to that um, and I'll have the dates for us next week and all of that. Um, as the chaos uh, subsides over the week, I'll get dates for you. Um, but come back tonight. We've got Wednesday night. We've got Thursday night. We're just going to have church this week. And praise the Lord, even if the devil hates us for it. Amen. Amen. Um, if you'd like to talk to me, I'll be up here. Brother Daniel will be up here. If you've got any questions about the service, ask Daniel. Um, if you just want to talk about football, talk to me. Brother Chris, he'll be taking uh, any food requests and anything like that. If you would like to know uh, what the best restaurant is in Charleston, he can tell you. Amen. But everything else goes to Daniel. We're going to relax. Right. And Daniel's going to take i I'm just picking on him today. All right. But, um, and Brother Mike will be around here too if you have anybody who uh, in your life that you'd like to talk about that's going through recovery or needs to go through recovery. Or you're an enabler and you need somebody to set you right. Mike does that and he does a good job at it. Amen. So if you're, if you're an enabler and you don't want to be set straight, don't, don't talk to me. Um, but anyways, all that being said, I'm thankful that be your pastor. I love you. I pray for you and I, I can't wait to see you again um, on Wednesday night. Because we have a church service on Wednesday night. I know it's new to some of you. But we have one. And I'd like to see you there. And for the kids, we'll have ice cream for them. And then we'll send them home to bed. Brother Chris.